Ever since the dawn of recorded history, it's been inculcated in people's minds that government is the master and people are the servants. Hardly anyone has ever questioned the idea that government should be managing the economy, should be directing the education of people's children, should be controlling religious activity, should be deciding what people read and what they look at. It's just been accepted that government officials would have the authority to do whatever they wanted in the best interest of society and that it was the job of the good little model citizen to meekly submit and obey and serve the greater good. All of a sudden, in 1776, a Virginian named Thomas Jefferson publishes a declaration that takes that age-old notion and flips it upside down. Jefferson suggests, hey, it's not the citizens who are the servants. It is the people who are the masters. It is you in government who are the servants. He wrote that all individuals are endowed with certain fundamental rights, inherent rights. They don't come from government. They come from nature. They come from God. No one needs to be beholden to government for these rights. And that in fact the sole job of government is to be the servant of the people in the protection of the exercise of these fundamental rights. It is the most radical declaration political declaration in history. It rattled not just the government officials of that time, it continues to rattle the power lusters to this day. Eleven years later, another Virginian, James Madison, crafts the Constitution with the idea of bringing the federal government into existence to replace the relatively weak central government under which Americans had been living under the Articles of Confederation. Americans didn't want to have anything to do with this new federal government. They understood that it potentially was the biggest threat to their freedom and their well-being. They knew what their own government had done throughout history. They knew English history. They, wanted, they didn't want to have anything to do with a government that would attract the po kind of power lusters that they knew what it would attract. The framer said, you don't need to worry. Because you see, this Constitution is calling into existence a government on our conditions. It is our servant. And one of the principal conditions is that it will have limited, enumerated powers. It won't have the power to do whatever it thinks is best for society. These are its powers, and that's it. It was a radical notion, once again. People around the world were shocked by the audaciousness of the American people to place limits on the power of their own government. But it was an idea that stretched as far back as Magna Carta. In 1215, when the barons of England held their own king at the, at the point of a sword, King John, and made him publicly acknowledge that his powers over the English people were limited. The American people finally accepted the idea of this new federal government, but only on one condition. They said, we will let you call this government into existence, but only on the condition that immediately after it comes into existence, you will enact a Bill of Rights, which really should have been called a Bill of Prohibitions, because it doesn't give any rights, contrary to what federal officials in Washington think, because rights come from nature and they come from God. And so we have the First Amendment, the Second Amendment, that protect people's fundamental rights. Freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, the right to peaceably assemble, the right to keep and bear arms. You've got the Fourth, Fifth, 
Sixth and Eighth Amendments that protected people from the most omnipotent power that a tyrannical government can ever exercise. The power of the sovereign to get, simply seize a citizen, cart him away to the Tower of London, torture him, and execute him without any due process of law, without any jury trials, without any judicial review whatsoever. That's what those amendments were all about. Now people said, hey, you know, we, the, the problem with enumerating these rights is the, the power lusters are going to think that that's all the rights we have. And that was the idea behind the Ninth Amendment. It says, hey, just because we're enumerating certain rights, don't get the idea that that's all the rights that we the people have. And then to make sure that the power lusters, those that are attracted to power, those that, that seek power in order to become masters and convert the citizenry into servants, the American people demanded the enactment of the Tenth Amendment which says that in this list of enumerated powers, all the other powers are reserved to the people and to the states. And so here you have a central government with very limited powers, divided into three branches to make sure it's even weaker. And then you've got this federal system where the state governments have jurisdiction over their geographical areas. And even that wasn't good enough for the American people. They enacted bills of rights at the state level to protect themselves from tyranny at their own state government levels. Now, what kind of society did, the, society did these principles bring into existence? Well, we all know that there were severe violations of the principles of freedom. The most horrific violation, of course, was slavery. But there was also tariffs. There were lots of minor exceptions, you know, land grants, railroad subsidies, and so forth. But for a large percentage of the American people, this was the most unusual society that mankind has ever seen, and the freest society. For here was a society, imagine, a society in which there is no income tax. People were free to accumulate unlimited amounts of wealth, and there was nothing the government could do about it. No Social Security, no Medicare, no Medicaid, no drug laws, no immigration controls, no economic regulations to speak of, no gun control, no Federal Reserve or Central Bank, sound money, no torture, no giant military establishment, no military industrial complex. No going abroad in search of monsters to destroy or to spread democracy with bombs and bullets and missiles. This is what it once meant to be an American. This is once what it once meant to be free. And it should give you a clue as to why this nation today is in the depths of despair. Because as our ancestors learned in 1861, when a nation violates and abandons its founding principles of liberty and embraces socialism, imperialism, interventionism, and statism, that is a nation that's going to reap the whirlwind, as this nation is now reaping. You've got out-of-control federal spending, out-of-control federal debt, hyperinflation on the horizon, out-of-control government, monetary and moral debauchery, militarism, empire, perpetual crises, perpetual wars, perpetual occupations, and perpetual infringements and growing infringements on the fundamental rights of the people. Is there a way to reverse this trend? You bet there is. If they could import statism to this country and reject everything this country was founded on, then we can export this statism out of this country. But what it entails is it entails a sound understanding of the principles of freedom in a free society, the importance of free will in a free society, freedom of choice 
of a limited government republic, of a market economy. Perhaps more important, it, it, it entails a restoration of a belief in ourselves, the self-reliance, the can-do, the independence that characterized our ancestors. Equally important, it involves a faith in other people, especially in the area of voluntary charity. Perhaps most important, it involves a rejection of the use of the coercive apparatus of government in the area of care and compassion for our fellow man. Because you see, what Americans have done, they have rendered unto Caesar something that belongs to God. And that is this area of coerced charity, coerced honoring your mother and father, coerced care and compassion for other people. It is that exclusive faith that must be placed in God himself and not in the federal government. Can we restore a free society to our land? Well, that's where you come in. Because you see, you are the new George Washingtons. You are the Thomas Jeffersons. You are the James Madisons. You are the Patrick Henrys. You are Virginians. And it is incumbent on you to lead this country, given your heritage of liberty, to lead this country out of this status morass in which we find ourselves. Benjamin Franklin once wrote, wherever there is liberty, that is my country. To which Thomas Paine responded, wherever there is not liberty, that is my country. We happen to have been born and raised and are living in a country that is Thomas Paine's ideal. Our challenge, our quest, is to convert this country in which we're living into Franklin's ideal. Thank you very much.